Okay, so we'll get started on our portion. Again, uh, we are in uh, Bereshit. Bereshit, and it is, we start in uh, chapter 32. We've left off in verse 2. We're going to start in verse 3. And uh, so remember what happened in, in, in chapter 31. We had... Uh, um, you know, in our last portion, Jacob fled away from Laban, and they had a very big sort of confrontation. Um, Laban is warned not to pursue him. Um, they avoid a war. Jacob, <coughs> pardon me, um, ends up departing, and uh, and uh, they. Uh, He's on his way back to the land. He's on his way back to the land. Now, remember, when he left, he left with the clothes on his back, right? He left with nothing, absolutely nothing. He's coming back now with, you know, four wives, 12 children, uh, 11 children. Yeah, 11 children. And uh, flocks and herds and, you know, lots of things. So... He's coming back, and so what happens next? Esau, Esau appears out of nowhere with a pretty big army, and he thinks, "Oh no, now I'm I'm toast," because he's gonna. He's last I heard, his he's, he's gonna kill me. So again, summarizing the the Torah portion here, um, in verse uh, in verse three, uh, Jacob sees this and. Uh, and he sends a messenger to Esau, and uh, he tries to appease him. And he tries to uh, avert this calamity of, um, you know, being destroyed by Esau, his brother. So he comes up with this bribe. He's got a lot of, uh, he's got bulls and donkeys and flocks and male and female servants. And uh, so he... Uh, in the meantime, while he's doing this, he separates his family, and this is kind of a really kind of a weaselly thing to do, and it really kind of shows where everybody was in the pecking order, right? So what does he do? He puts he puts in front, you know, the people that would he splits his group into two two groups basically. So he's thinking one can get away, and he gives you know, the better position to Rachel, the one that's most likely, if something's going to happen, is Leah, is going to get the one that's going to get, going to basically get whacked. And uh, so that's kind of a, really kind of a weaselly thing to do. But he does also, uh, in chapter 32, we also see that, that uh, uh, when you, when, uh, Jacob comes and he actually uh, gets to Jacob. He puts himself in front of his family. So he bows down to Esau seven times and turns out, uh, turns out that he is, uh, Esau's got over this. He's still a little miffed, you know, but he's not, he's not murderous anymore. So he's, a, you know, he says, I don't really need your stuff. You know, you can keep it. Um, let's. Yeah. So you know, they both you know embrace, and um, there's uh, you know there's a reconciliation there, which is you know a really good thing. Um, so we see here in uh, in uh, yeah in verse uh, twenty he says, your servant Jacob is behind us, and he says. Let me appease him with the present that goes before me. And after that, he sees my face, he might accept me. And the present was passed over before him. But he himself spent the night in the camp. And he rose up that night and took his two wives and his two female servants, his 11 sons, passed over the ford of Yabok. And he took them and sent them over the stream and sent over what he had. And so Jacob was then alone. 
And the rest of chapter 32 talks about this this incident where out of nowhere a man comes and wrestles with him. And it doesn't really say who started the wrestling. I'm, I'm thinking Jacob started it. Why did he start? Because he knew who this was. He knew that this was Yahshua. You know, communing to, communicating to him as Yahweh, the angel of Yahweh, the messenger of Yahweh. He's communicated with this being before. And he... he uh, This is sort of also an analogy, as we're going to get into later, about our struggle in our, in our walk. So, um, Jacob knows that he's wandered off the path a little bit, you know, from time to time. And he wants to get back on. He wants to get back right with Yahweh. And um, so, that, hence what this wrestling is all about. And it's sort of a, you know, an, an analogy or a, um, that he doesn't want to give up. He, he doesn't want to, you know, just go along without having, uh, having this, uh, this resolve. And he says in verse 26, he says, let me go. This is... The angel now, the angel of Yahweh, Yahshua, is saying, let me go for the day breaks. But Jacob said, I am not letting you go until you have blessed me. I'm going to keep fighting. I'm going to keep on this. I'm going to keep struggling until you bless me. It's something for us to think about. Something for us to think about with our lives. When things are tough, when, you know, we seem like we have a distance from Yahweh, and all of us have been there. You know, we feel like I'm struggling, I'm not getting through, my prayers stop at the ceiling, I don't really get anywhere. This is our, us too. We need to wrestle. We need to really grab a hold and not let go until he blesses us. And he will, and he says, what is your name? And he says, Yaakov. And he said, your name is no longer Jacob, but Yisrael, because you have striven with Elohim and with men and have overcome. So that's what Israel means. It means overcomers. And that's us, right? We're part of the family of Israel. We're grafted into Israel, right? So in order to be grafted in, we have to also become overcomers Overcoming this world, overcoming our own flesh and our own temptations, our own, you know, lust that we have in ourselves for various different things. Um, we have to become, as, as uh, Jacob did, and, uh, and wrestle and really struggle and make sure that we don't give up and just go... Oh, well, what's the use? You know, that's kind of our inclination sometimes. We go, I can't do this anymore. It's too hard. It's too, you know, it's too much. I I just can't hang. That's what Jacob could have done, right? He could have just crossed the Yabak and went with his wives and kids and, you know, went on his way and said, well, I got plenty of stuff here. I'm okay. But he didn't. He didn't do that. He, this was important to him. This was his whole life. He needed to have this done and, uh, and be able to uh, and be this overcomer. So in verse 30 we say, oh, let's back up to 29. He says, Jacob asked him, saying, please let me know your name. And he says, why do you ask my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name uh, of the place Peniel, Peniel, for I have seen the uh, Elohim face to face, and my life is preserved. Then the sun rose on him, and he passed over Penuel and limped on his hip. So, 
that's an important thing for us to keep in mind. This is a, a you know, a, a struggle that kind of reflects what's going on in our life, and we really want to be like Jacob was. This is one time where he rose to the occasion and really, he's really coming into his own now as a leader of, uh, and a, uh, and a, uh, a servant of Yahweh. So chapter 33 is, you know, where we see uh, Jacob splits up the, uh, uh, or Jacob and, and uh, Esau meet, and, and he splits up the families. And, and um, chapter 34, we get into this, uh, which we're, we're not going to really talk about. Dina is the daughter of Leah. And there was... Uh, a lot of a lot of blame to go around in this. Uh, certainly, Shechem had uh, acted badly, but you can sort of deduce from this. But so did Dinah. Uh, so there was enough really blame to go around. Uh, but in any case, um, they did not get married. So. This would be, uh, you know, we get these people that go, see, all you have to do is come together and you're married, right? Well, that didn't happen here, did it? <laughs> so that, doesn't, that argument doesn't hold water. So all you have to do is come together and that makes you married? That didn't happen here. She wasn't interested in that Well, I don't know if she was or not because we never hear if she, it, nobody asks her. And well, it is up it is up to her father, but we see in other places, you know, for example, we see in Ripka, right? With Ripka, you know, they come and they say she's going to be, you know, this is the one, and Laban says, okay, you can. Uh, that's her brother, no, Nachor says, okay, but let's ask her first. Right? Ripka had a choice. She could have said, no, I, I'm not going there. There's no way I'm leaving this place. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't say that, it, it doesn't say that specifically. So, Dina, Right. So Dana went out from her, under her father's covering, out with the daughters of the land, right? Other people. And, <clears throat> you know, what could have happened? I don't know. We don't know for sure what happened. But what could have happened is flirting going on, you know? And... Uh, Absolutely. And Shechem is going, oh, you're beautiful, uh, you know, and come on here. And before you know it, you know, events lead to one another. And before you know it, they're together. Now she's ruined, you know. So Shimon and Levi, they don't really, I don't think, really care about their sister's honor. They really care about their own vanity. And that's why they go, okay, we got to kill these guys because they defiled our, our sister. We never see D Dana going, you know, this was, uh, you know, she, crying out and screaming or anything like that, asking to be rescued. Um, you would think Shechem <clears throat> would not, you know, make as big a deal as he did about this, about getting Dana as his wife, if she was kicking and screaming and, and uh, you know, spitting in his face and, you know, that kind of stuff. Scratching. You know, scratching him and fighting back. You would, you would think he would not be after, you know, his father to get him as a wife. So you, I think you can kind of deduce in here that Dana was at least, if not a willing participant, at least was not objecting to this. Could have been manipulated. She could have been a young girl. Could have been just, you know, swept off her feet and, and just, 
you know, enamored and, you know, uh, made a big mistake. Mm -hmm. So by by humbled her, of course, if, um, you know, uh, a... uh, a virgin girl who's no longer a virgin has been humbled, you know, has been, you know, basically she's used property now. She's not marketable anymore. And so that's what they mean by humbled, you know, and then obviously that's hard for us in 21st century America to kind of wrap our heads around that kind of concept, but that's really what they had. But, you know, a righteous father... Jacob, you know, if he'd have been behaving correctly with this, first of all, would have, you know, been aware of his daughter running off to these, you know, outside and messing with the, the women of the land, you know, in that, in that, uh, you know, yeah, in that culture and also, you know, in that way of thinking. Yeah, they're very pagan. Yeah, yeah absolutely they are. These are the Canaanites that are full of all these wicked, wicked sort of, uh, you know, deities. But, you know, this is something we can kind of take as a lesson for ourselves. You know, Jacob wasn't paying attention to what his daughter was up to. You know, should have, you know, if, if as soon as he found out about her thinking, hey, I want to go over here and go, wait a minute, Dana, this is a wrong place. You don't want to be talking to these girls. You don't want to be around these girls. You don't want to be anywhere near them. You don't want to hear what they have to say because they are going to lead you astray. And it looks like that's what happened. And so. Yeah, well, you know, and the act of humbling her, you know, of course, again, if if she was, you know, screaming and kicking and biting and scratching and spitting in his face, you know, he wouldn't be behaving like that towards her. So that's, you know, I read this to saying she, uh, she was okay with that. She would have been very happy to be, you know... Um, the wife of this Shechem, who was the leader of this big tribe, this big group, and uh, basically the son of a king, and, you know, full of a lot of, probably a lot of money, a lot of wealth, you know, that kind of thing. I, I think we can relate to that kind of thing, that how, you know, young girls get talked into that kind of thing all the time in 21st century America, right? You know, and some of them ends up really, really bad for them. This ended up really bad because a lot of people were killed, and uh, anyway, we that's that's what went on with that. Um, we're going to read chapter thirty-five when we uh, um, pick this up, but I also want to talk a little bit. We'll go into chapter thirty-six. Thirty-six really is uh, kind of a uh, a genealogy of Esau. And we're going to just kind of point out a couple of things out of chapter 36. So let's just read chapter 35, and we'll go from, uh, from there. And Elohim said to Jacob, Rise up and go to Bethel and dwell there, and make a slaughter place to El who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. And Jacob said to his household and all who were with him, Put away the four and mighty ones who are among you. Cleanse yourself and change your garments. You probably remember last year when we were in uh, Torah portions in Exodus that uh, when, you know, the people came before Mount Sinai, what did Moshe tell them to do? Wash, change your garments. So, same kind of thing. Let us rise and go up to Bethel. Let us make there a slaughter place to El, who answered me in the day of my distress 
and has been with me in the way which I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign mighty ones which were in their hands, all their earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree which was near Shechem. They departed, and the fear of Elohim was upon the cities that were all around, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. And Jacob came to Lutz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, and he and all the people who were with him. And he built there a slaughter place and called the place El Bethel, because there Elohim appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. And Deborah, Ribka's nurse, died, and she was buried below Bethel under uh, the terebinth tree, so the name was called Alan Bakuth. And Elohim appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padam Aram and blessed him. And Elohim said, here's again this Abrahamic blessing. He said, your name is Jacob. Your name is no longer Jacob, but Israel is your name. So he called his name Israel. And Elohim said to him, I am El Shaddai. Shaddai, be fruitful and increase, a nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and sovereigns shall come from your body. We're going to see this again, this blessing that he passes on to his sons. We're going to see that in chapter 48. And Elohim went up from him in the place where he had spoken with him, and Jacob set up a standing column in the place where he had spoken with him, a monument of stone, here we have this cornerstone, and he poured a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it. Those are going to be significant later on. We'll see that as anointed stone. Who do we know is the appoint uh, the anointed stone? Is Yahshua, right? The chief cornerstone. Jacob called the name of the place where Elohim spoke with him, Beth El, and they set out from Beth El. And it came to be when they were just a little distance to go to Eph Ephrath that Rachel began to give birth and had great difficulty giving birth. And it came to be as she was having great difficulty giving birth that the midwife said to her, Do not fear, for it is another son for you. And it came to be as her life was going out, for she died, that she called his name Ben-Ani, but his father called him bin Yamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob sent a standing column on her burying place, which is a monument of Rachel's burial place to this day. So, Brother Dave, you were asking about Rachel's burial place. Is it still there? Yes, it's in Bethlehem. And there's t Rachel's tomb is there. It's in the occupied West Bank in, well... I should say occupied West Bank. It's in the Palestinian area. And it's, uh, should we say, it's not, it's, it's sort of a dangerous place to go. But you can see it. You can actually, there's, there's tours that you can take from Israel into, into the uh, Palestinian area, and you can go see Rachel's tomb, and it's still there. All right, uh, and it came to be when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went and lay with his Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard about it. Now the sons of Jacob were 12. The sons of Leah were Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Shimon, and Levi, and Yehuda, and Yisachar, and Zebulun, and the sons of Rachel were Yosef and Benjamin. Sons of Bilhah, Rachel's female servant were Dan and Naphtali, and the sons of Zilpah, Leah's female servant, were God and Asher. And the sons of Jacob were born to him in Padam Aran. And Jacob came to his father Yitzhak at Mamre, or uh, Kirath Abar, with, that is Hebron, Hebron, where uh, Abraham and Yitzhak dwelt. That's where, remember that uh, that cave that Abraham bought to bury Sarah. Abraham was buried there. Now they're going to bury Isaac there. Ribka had already died. She's already in that tomb. So the days of Yitzhak were 180 years. So he was pretty old. How old was Yaakov at that time? 
So Jacob was born when he was 60 years old. So that would make him 120, Jacob 120 years old. He'll have 27 more years to live before he dies as well. And he's also going to be buried in this very same tomb along with Leah. <clears throat> so that's kind of interesting. All right, so we talk about chapter 35. Jacob, uh, 20 years late, earlier, had left Canaan, uh, Canaan in disgrace, fle fleeing eastward in exile. As later on, his, his, uh, uh, his descendants would do uh, generations later, where uh, in captivity to Laban, he pays the price for being a deceiver. And in captivity, Jacob prospers and is finally able to return to the promised land on route back to Canaan, he goes through a wilderness experience and the children of his namesake would do generations later. <clears throat> so we kind of take a look at, you know, Jacob is allowed to go back into the promised land. We want to take a look at what, who would be not allowed into the promised land. And we can see that in Hebrews chapter 4. So let's go there. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4. And in verse 1 it starts out, Hebrews chapter 4, it says, the writer says, Therefore, since a promise remains for entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the good news was brought to us as well as to them. He's talking about patriarchs and talking about the people in the past, uh, but the word which they heard did not profit them, and having uh, been mixed with belief in those who heard it. Uh, for we who have believed do enter into that rest, as he had said, I swore in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest. And yet his works have come into being from the foundation of the world. So again, we see... Um, here, as we drop down a little farther, we're going to see uh, in verse 11, let us therefore do our utmost to enter that rest, lest anyone fall after the same example of disobedience. So <clears throat> those are people that, uh, that were, they're, they're, it was not, they didn't have the faith uh, to have that, uh, to be able to enter into that, into that rest. The writer speaks about, the writer of Hebrews, that is, speaks about doubt and unbelief, faith and hardness of heart versus resting in Yahweh and not in the works of our flesh. And that's, you know, kind of the whole concept of Judaism, again, is, you know, you can earn your salvation by what you do. You know, we know that that's not the case. We see that all throughout the Old Testament that he never says, if you check off these boxes, if you do all these things, you will be saved. You have to have faith. And grace comes from belief. So he's coming home like the prodigal son to the home of his earthly parents and to, and to that of his heavenly father. The house is Beth El, house of Elohim, or house of Yahweh. So what was required of Jacob? He had to manifest brokenness, humility, a new identity, repentance, and make restitution for the sins that he committed against others. So we can see that in that, demonstrating that as he wrestles with the messenger of Yahweh, right? He, he you know, wants to overcome his sinful self and wants to get that blessing and won't let go until he does it. <clears throat> So we kind of have to ask ourselves, you know, are we fighting the progress uh, process that Yahweh is working in our lives for our spiritual Bethel or our spiritual to work, to live in Yahweh's house? Um, <clears throat> Jacob hit it again and again until his carnal will was finally broken and his heart was circumcised. So that circumcision concept is certainly never was was not didn't start at Mount Sinai, that had been there all along. And Yahweh always wanted circumcision of the heart. 
Okay, that's always where he was he was looking for. <clears throat> that's not a New Testament concept of the circumcision of the heart. That was there from the very beginning. So we can kind of ask ourselves, where are we in this spiritual process? You know, the promised land belongs to those that is the seed of Jacob who passed the wilderness test. So who is that seed? Let's go to Romans chapter 4. And we start in verse 16 here. He says, um, All right, so let's back up to verse 14. So he's making this contrast between, um, again, people that have this concept that, you know, works of the flesh, works of the Torah, it will get you saved. And here he says in verse 14, for if those who are of the Torah are heirs, belief has been made useless and the promise has been nullified. So he's refuting this argument that, you know, works of the Torah will get you saved. You know, our Christian friends take that and kind of turn it upside down and say, see, you don't need the Torah anymore, right? You don't need it. Paul says it right here, you know. For if the Torah works out wrath, for, with, for the, where there is no Torah, there is no transgression. On account of this, it is a belief that it be according to favor or grace. It's according to grace. Grace, we, re we receive salvation as a free gift, not because of anything we do. However, if we don't, if we are not obedient, we don't put ourselves in a position to be able to receive that gift. Right? So, like for example, you know, you could go up to, uh, you know, the state lottery guys and go, um, I'm claiming that million dollar prize. And they go, okay, let me see your ticket. Well, I didn't buy a ticket. I didn't think I wanted, I had to do that, you know. I would thought that wasn't necessary that I have to buy a ticket. I just, I want the prize. And they go, well, that's not how that works. In order to be able to receive the prize, right, you have to do something first, right? You have to buy the winning ticket. Now, for us, it's not the odds aren't, you know, a good gazillion to one, you know, but we do have to be called and chosen and faithful. What does that mean? Walking in Torah, walking in what uh, the instructions Yahweh gives us to put ourselves in a position that we can receive that gift. Same thing. So that kind of hopefully puts that in a more understandable way. It's not free. Yeah, it, it is free. And it, there isn't a, something you can do to earn it, okay? There's not something you can say, I've done all these things, now you owe me salvation, Yahweh, right? Because I've done these things. I've fulfilled my duty, right? That's not how it works. Exactly. We have to have the faith that Yahweh will do this. And if we have that faith, if we have that faith, that belief that Yahweh will grant us salvation, we want to please our Father, and we want to walk in ways that pleases Him, which is Torah, right? So, not the other way around. We don't do that first, you know, expecting that He owes us something. We do that because of His love for us and His grace for us. So, not only are those of the Torah, but also those who are of the belief of Abraham, who is father of us all, as it has been written, I have made you the, a father of many nations in the presence of him who he believed, even Elohim, who gives life to the dead and calls that which does not exist as existing, who against all expectations did believe in expectations so that he should become 
the father of many nations according to what was said, so shall your seed be. So we're talking about who is the seed. Well, it's the seed of Abraham. It's the seed of people who are grafted in to, into uh, Israel uh, and who are walking in this way, the same way Abraham did and Yitzhak did and Jacob did. So I want to point out one more thing here as we see in, in verse 17. The last half of that verse says, even Elohim who gives life to the dead and calls that which does not exist as existing. So that's kind of a very interesting concept. So when Yahweh talks about things that have not yet happened, he talks about them like they really did happen. Like our salvation is one thing. Okay, He talks about our salvation as already having been accomplished. But really we know from other scriptures that really it's not. Why? Because we have to endure to the end, right? We can lose our salvation if, you know, if we turn our back and we see that in other places and we go against him. We can lose that, but Yahweh knows, he can see in advance and he sees that we are going to be successful, we are going to be part of his kingdom, and he, he, uh, he calls that which does not exist, you know, us as spirit beings, as existing. And that's pretty cool, I think. Anyway, let's move on. So let's go to uh, Galatians 3. And it's going to talk more about the sons of Abraham. We're going to go to Galatians 3. <clears throat> so we're in verse 7. So actually, there's a lot in verse in chapter three. We're not going to read the whole thing, but we want to kind of glean some some uh, some bits out of this to be able to understand what uh, Shaul is talking about here when he's talking about um, the sons of Abraham. So we start in verse six. Even so, Abraham did believe Elohim, and it was reckoned to him unto as unto him as righteousness. Know then that those who are of belief are sons of Abraham. So if we're walking as Abraham did, believing that Yahweh is able to do what he says he is able to do and will bring about this salvation for us um, and walking in obedience, right? Where does that come from? We're, we're going to see that in... Uh, in uh, Torah. Yeah, yeah, of course, in, in chapter 15, which we just read a couple of weeks ago, that whole thing about um, Ab Abraham's obedience and how he obeyed him. You know, Yahweh says, move from um, Haran to Canaan, right? And he didn't say, well, wait a minute, you know, I got all my family here, I've got a lot of money here, we got a pretty good deal. I can't really go right now. How about if we do that a year from now? Let me sell something. What did he do? He said he left. He just went. You know, so he, he was obedient. Um, <clears throat> when Yahweh told him to sacrifice his son, he didn't reason through this and go, this doesn't make sense. I don't think we should really do that. You know, he just went to do it, knowing that Yahweh was able Somehow he was going to make this work out. He didn't know how. He didn't know what was going to happen. But he's, he, Abraham's thought process was, Yahweh said to do it. I'm going to do it. Somehow this is going to work. I don't know how. It might be he'll you know, stop at the last minute. Maybe he'll bring Isaac back to life again. Who knows? But we're going to do this. And... It, uh, that's the kind of thought process that Abraham has that we need to have as sons of Abraham. When Yahweh says do, we do. We don't question, we don't say, you know, uh, strings on my clothes look pretty silly. I don't really want to do that. <laughs> right? I'm not sure why, but I'm doing it. I'm, I'm just going to do it because he says to do it. You know, 
Uh, everybody else is doing going to church on sa Sunday, you know, wearing covering on your head too. Another thing, you know, that's a, a big stumbling block for a lot of women. They go, you know, I have to study this out and I have to really get my wrap my head around this and really have to ask the Father. He says very plainly to do it, you know, to, <laughs> to cover your head. So whether you understand it or not, really the best way to understand it is obedience first. Understanding usually follows obedience. It almost, you know, doesn't go the other way around when you, you know, try to use all your human reasoning to figure out, you know, what Yahweh really wants you to do and what this really means and all the implications and all that stuff. Just do it. And you will see, oh, Yahweh sees your obedience. He sees your heart. And he sees that you want to be an obedient servant. And that's the way he saw Abraham. Why did Paul write in there about if it's a stumbling block? Yeah, okay, I know what you mean. He's talking about meat, mainly. He's talking about meat, mainly, about stumbling blocks. Yeah. Well, if we talk about head coverings, we'll just kind of stop for a, a minute here and just go to that spot um, where, because uh, Paul does sort of mention something here in, in 1 Corinthians 11. No, don't let that be the division of the body. Well, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying here is, he says, uh, um, here in... Here, first, chapter 11, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and in verse 16, he says, How if, however, anyone seems to be contentious, okay, goes, I don't think we should do that. You know, we do not have such a habit, nor do the assemblies of Yahweh. So basically is, you know, these, these are the instructions. Don't, don't argue about this. And in declaring this, I do not praise you since you come together not for the better, for the worst. And then he comes to get talking about divisions. I hear that when you come together as an assembly, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. For there have to be factions, even among you, so that the approved ones might be revealed among you. There will be factions. There will be people that go, no, I'm not doing that. Right? What Paul is really saying here is what that does is a what people do reveals what's in their heart. When you see obedient people that are being obedient, not to what, you know, somebody, some leader says to do, but what the scriptures say to do, you know, and are walking this way, you know, as opposed to people that always have their dukes up that always have to argue with somebody. We always have, well, here, and here's a clue on how this, where you see this happening. You'll say, here's how I see it. Right? They don't say, this is what the scriptures teach. They say, here's how I see it. When you hear that, your ear should prick up and say, well, this is a person that's causing division. <laughs> anyway. I think we went to that point again. Let's get back on track again. We're in Galatians 3 9. Uh, we read 7, and, 7 to 9, right? Uh, Those then who are of the belief are sons of Abraham, and the scripture, having foreseen that Elohim would declare right the nations by belief, Announce the good news to Abraham before, saying, All the nations shall be blessed in you. So, again, nobody should have been surprised at this, that the, the evangel was going to come to everybody all over the world, not just Judah. So that you who are of belief are blessed with Abraham, the believer. Again, Paul is making this point that we come, we're grafted into Israel we're grafted into the nation, the family of Israel by our belief. We might not be 
you know, physical DNA sort of descendants of Yaakov, but we are just as good as those who are because of our belief. We are just as, uh, as good as they are. So let's go to, uh, uh, skim down a little far farther, we go to uh, verse 14. So that in order that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the nations in Messiah to receive the promise of the Spirit through belief. Um, and the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed, Abraham and to his seed, the seed he's talking about there is Messiah, and he does not say, and to seeds, but of many, but of one, and to your seed, Messiah. Um, and then down to verse 28. So he says, there is neither Yehudi nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is not male nor female, for you are all one in Messiah, Yahshua, and if you are of Messiah, then you are at the seed of Abraham, and heirs according to the promise. So that's what puts us in uh, <clears throat> the uh, as the seed of Abraham or the family of, uh, of Israel is our belief in Messiah Yahshua that uh, that his sins would in fact cover our uh, or his uh, his sacrifice would in fact cover our sins and make us as we just read in in. Uh, uh, earlier about uh, in uh, we said in Hebrews yep where it says uh, that uh, Yahweh sees us as we will be not as not as we are right now uh, so although this salvation hasn't been accomplished yet he sees us that it, it is accomplished because he sees the path that we're on. He sees that we're on this narrow, narrow path. He can, of course, see the future and know for sure that we will be in the kingdom or not. But um, he, he's, he's looking at us like we are, like we've already made it. So just like, um, you know, just like Jacob did, we go to Revelation 18.4 and... Most of us know that verse kind of by heart. It says that I heard another voice from the heavens saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive her plagues. So are we not following in our father Jacob's footsteps, leaving our exile and captivity in Babylon or that false religious system which contains a mixture of both uh, good and evil and returning westward across the Jordan into the pr promised land to our spiritual inheritance. And that's really where we have to be focused, which is, is defined in terms of Yahweh's covenants with Israel. Let's go to uh, Ephesians chapter 2 as we begin to wrap this up here. Begin um, Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, and we're going to start at verse 11. And it says, therefore, remember that you, once nations in the flesh, or once, it's some translations will say Gentiles in the flesh. We were outside of the covenant. We were outside of the, uh, the family of Israel, who are called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made, by flesh by made in the flesh by hand. And at that time, you were without Messiah, excluded from the citizenship of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no expectation and without Elohim in the world. But now in Messiah Yahshua, you who were once far off have been brought near. We've been brought near by the blood of Messiah, by, by the blood of Yahshua. So... <clears throat> By being brought near, we're brought into the family of Israel. We're, we're made children of Abraham, and uh, we're able to uh, participate in that. So we sort of understand that Yash, uh, Jacob's life is sort of a prophetic roadmap, as we see this, a prophetic roadmap of what each individual must go through to obtain a spiritual inheritance. 
his life is sort of a prophetic picture. If we can kind of just imagine, just kind of see our walk paralleling what Jacob's walk looked like. His life is a prophetic picture, picture of what all Israel collectively must go through as well. And then, of course, we go back again to, to Matthew 13, and we can kind of connect every, every bit of scripture, every, every Torah portion to this verse again in Matthew 7, which kind of sums up again our, uh, what, what we're trying to accomplish here now. And that is uh, Matthew 7. And we start in 13, right? Matthew 7 and verse 13. Enter in through the narrow gate. You know, he's given us the formula. Matthew 7, verse 13. He's given us a formula. Enter in through the narrow gate because the gate is wide. He's given us a warning here. The gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. So again, if you look around and you see a lot of people on the road, that should be a clue. That should be a warning. That should be uh, a light should go off and say, wait a minute, I might be on the road to destruction because this looks pretty broad. And it's pretty wide. So you want to reconsider if you see that kind of thing going on. So if you're in a, in a group of people worshiping that has a billion people in it, that should be a clue to you. You're probably on the broad way, right? That leads to destruction. Because the gate is narrow and the way is difficult or hard-pressed or afflicted, which leads to life, and there are few who find it. So if you see a very small flock that are worshiping, and they look through the scriptures every Sabbath, every day, they're looking through the scriptures, what else am I missing? What else do I, should I be doing that I'm not doing now? What else can I do to be more obedient to Yahweh, my Father? How can I be a better believer, a more obedient son? We search the scriptures to tell us that. Then you might be entering through the, the narrow gate. You might be on this narrow path. And that's really what we want to be focused on, is being on this narrow path. Um, <clears throat> and not to let anything draw us off of this path. Um, and what can draw us off the path? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. So in Ephesians, Paul is talking to us about walking on this narrow path. Um... And it's talking about, you know, entering into uh, Yahweh's rest or entering into the promised land. He says in verse 10, For the rest, my brothers, be strong in the master and in the mightiness of his strength. Put on the complete armor of Elohim, for you have the power to stand against the schemes of the devil. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. So the people that we come in contact with that, of course, are sometimes causing us difficulty and trouble. That's not, those aren't our enemy. Our enemy is really the, the uh, Hasatan uh, against principalities, against authorities, against world rulers and the darkness of this age, against spiritual matters of wickedness in the heavenlies. So he's telling us, take up the whole armor of Yahweh. And he gives us all of these defensive weapons, you know, to protect ourselves, right? We have all of these things we have um, that to protect ourselves are girded with the truth. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Fit your feet with the preparation of the good news of peace. And the shield of faith. All of those are defensive weapons, right? And all of those hang on the truth, right? Which is the belt. And 
and you also take on the helmet of salvation. And he gives us one offensive weapon, one offensive weapon, and that is what? The sword of truth. And that's exactly the same offensive weapon that Yahshua used when he was confronted face to face with, with the enemy, right? What did he fight back with? With scripture. Every answer that he gave, every accusation, every temptation that the enemy threw at him, if you are a son of God, kind of, or, or son of Yahweh, and taunting him, saying, if you could do this, if you really are what you claim to be, you know, trying to get to his vanity, didn't work, right? What did Yahshua use? He used the sword of truth, and he quoted scripture to him. And that's, again, an example for us of how to deal with these things that pull us off this path and get us lost in the weeds, get us lost in the forest. Um, so let's go to Philippians chapter 1 as we wrap up this portion here. Philippians chapter 1 also uh, talks about <clears throat> the struggle. You know, we talked about the struggle that ya uh, Yaakov had with the, the man of uh, Yahweh or the Melech, uh, or Malach, the uh, angel of Yahweh and in chapter 1 in verse 27 he talks about this he says behave yourselves worthily we're in Philippians chapter 1 verse 27 worthily of the good news of Messiah in order that whether I come and see you or, or am absent I hear about you that you stand fast in one spirit with one being striving together for the belief of the good news without being frightened in any way by those who oppose, which to them is truly a proof of destruction, but to you of deliverance and that of Elohim, because to you it has been given as a favor or as grace on behalf of Messiah, not only to believe in him, here comes the bad news, but also to suffer for his sake. So, Struggling is part of this walk. Remember we talked about, we saw in Matthew 7, that way is afflicted or it's hard pressed. It's not easy. This is not for the weak. This is for people who are spiritually strong and we have Yahweh helping us through that. So uh, in verse 30, having the same struggle which you saw in me and now here in me. So what's happening to Paul right now? He's in prison, right? He's being held in chains and is eventually going to be actually executed by the Roman government. Um, so, you know, he's got a tough struggle. Ours isn't anywhere near that bad. All right, so I want to wrap this up again with, uh, with chapter 36. We just want to talk about one thing here. In chapter 36, we get this whole so-and-so begot so-and-so and begot so-and-so. There's a lot of begottens in chapter 36, right? There's a lot of family history. But there's one thing I want to point out here, and it's one guy that it's, it's pretty significant because we're going to see here in chapter... 36 and in verse, uh, this is a verse 11. No, let's go to 10. So these were the names of Esau's sons. Eliphaz, the son of Adab, wife of Esau, and Ruel, son of Basimuth, wife of Esau. Both of those women, you know, were, uh, were Canaanite women. And the sons of Ephaz were Teman, Omar, Sepho, Gatam, Kenaz, and then we have Timnah was the son of a concubine of Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bore Amalek, Amalek to Ephaz. These were the sons of Adah, Esau's wife. So who is this Amalek guy, and why is that important? Well, in the future, we're going to see Amalek is going to be horrendous um, sort of attacking uh, Israel continually. We're going to see as they come out of Egypt, 
Amalek is going to be the ones that attack the women and children at the back of the, the column. And they're just a ruthless, wicked people. And um, we see that in, uh, in Exodus chapter 17, verses 14 to 16, Yahweh says to Moshe, write this for a remembrance in a book and recite it in the hearing of uh, Yahshua that I completely blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moshe built a slaughter place and called his name Yahweh and he say, and because a hand is on the throne of Yah, Yahweh is to fight against Amalek from generation to generation. We also see that in Deuteronomy 25 verse 17. And we're going to see it in uh, 1 Samuel 15, 2, about Yahweh punishing Amalek. But unfortunately, Israel didn't follow instructions, and they didn't completely destroy Amalek when they were told to. So we're going to see Amalek is going to show up again in the book of Esther, right? And we see Mordecai is... is, uh, is uh, plagued by this uh, Haman who is you know from Amalek so we're going to see uh, him crop up through the through the uh, this yeah through the uh, through the scriptures as we go forward but I thought that was important to point out he was uh, an adversary of Israel uh, an adversary from you know his brother so that uh, is where we'll wrap this up and, and I hope this has been a blessing to you. We'll uh, end the study right there.